and welcome. This is a webinar about uh, new processes available on the Open Science Framework Secondary Data Pre-Registration Template. Joining us today, Omo Van de Acker, PhD candidate, ca candidate at Tilburg University School of Social and Behavioral Sciences in the Department of Methodology. Pam davis Keen, Professor of Psychology from the University of Michigan. Marion Bacher uh, should be joining, just joined us, great, thank you. Uh, also from the Tilburg School of Social and Behavioral Sciences in the uh, Department of Methodology. Leaders who have been developing uh, for several years now, standards and best practices for uh, working with uh, for registration, particularly with existing data sets and using those. Today's webinar will give an overview of all the issues surrounding, surrounding uh, and benefits of pre-registration and the specific impl implications of doing so with secondary data analysis. We'll give a brief overview of how the template was created, the history of that and where it exists right now. Give a brief demo of what it looks like on the OSF. Then we'll follow up with a couple of points about important reminders for when you're writing up the results of pre-registered work. And importantly, ways to provide feedback on how it looks in the registry and the uh, types of disciplines it is most relevant to. We'll wrap up with a Q&A session. A lot of the uh, great discussion will occur during that time. So please use the Q&A box. I'll be, mon I'll be monitoring that throughout the webinar. So if there's a point of clarification, I'll stop us and interrupt. Um, but otherwise, most questions will leave till the end. With that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and pass it over to Olmo. So that should work. So good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, or good evening. I'm not sure which time zone everyone is in. Uh, for me, it's afternoon, so I'll stick with that. Uh, yes, so today uh, we'll be discussing our template for the pre-registration of secondary data analysis. And I would like to start with um, basically the basics. So what is secondary data? So of course, the name secondary data implies that there's also primary data. And primary data is basically uh, the data you get when you uh, go to the standard empirical cycles, scientific methods. So we have a scientist, they have a research question or an hypothesis, and based on that research question or hypothesis, they uh, collect data. Uh, so th the goal of that data collection is to specifically address that research question or hypothesis. So that's the standard empirical cycle, and that's what we call primary data. So secondary data, then uh, someone else comes in basically. So we have another scientist and they have another question, another research question than the um, first one I talked about, but they will use the, the data that was collected by the other scientists. So they will use someone else's data uh, and answer a different research question than what the data was originally collected for. So that's an important uh, distinction with, between primary and secondary data. In primary data, the data has been collected specifically for that research question. In secondary data, that's not the case, but the data can still answer questions uh, of relevant to that research. Uh, secondary data is also revisiting your own data. So in this case, we have the same researcher again, but now they have a different research question or different hypothesis, but they can still go back to the data they originally collected for this reason, and that would still constitute as secondary data. Um, we also, uh, we call secondary data also uh, existing data. So you can use that as synonym, synonyms. Um, and finally, it's not always the case that uh, individual researchers collect data for to answer their research questions. It can also be institutions uh, that can just collect a large, a sample of data that other researchers can use. So in that sense, there is no primary data because the institution didn't really um, collect the data for a specific hypothesis, 
but there is secondary data because other researchers are using the data for their own research questions. So hopefully that sets the stage. Um, now for some examples of secondary data. Um, a lot of it is large representative surveys. So for example, the European Social Survey. Um, that's just a, a wide range of data uh, about all kinds of attitudes of Europeans. There's also the World Bank that provides open data that other researchers can use. So these are the institutions that I just talked about. And there's, of course, the individual researchers that provide their data on OSF, for example, and other people can use that data to do their own analyses. So that also constitutes secondary data analysis. And now in this age of open science and open data, uh, we should see that more and more often. So now to some characteristics of secondary data. So one thing is that there are often many different variables, respondents, and time points. So uh, as I just showed you those uh, really large European surveys, uh, they contain a lot of data points, they contain a lot of variables, and that also that makes it into a kind of a data buffet. You know, there's so much things to choose. Um, and it also means that there are so many research degrees of freedoms, because I have this variable I want to measure, but I can do so in this way, this way, or this way. But which, way, which one am I going to choose? So again, we have a researcher and a research question, and he can uh, use one variable of the data set, but he can also use another, and he can also use another. And maybe the last one finally gets him a significant result. Um, this is a problem because that's data contingent decision-making. So you first look at the result and then decide what you do. Uh, we also call that p-hacking. And one uh, solution to that is pre-registration. So that's the reason why we're all here. And so that basically blocks these researchers' choices and only limits you to the one you uh, pre-defined or uh, pre-registered, basically. So in that sense, pre-registration can prevent this data fake that I talked about. Also unique to secondary data is that they're often really hard to come by. For example, it's uh, data from hunter-gatherer societies that other people will use because they cannot uh, look at data themselves. So it's often unique data. And it also means that there will be many analysis done on this data. Uh, and that means either you yourself have prior knowledge of the data because you're revising the data over and over again, or because a lot of other people have used it, then you might know from them uh, stuff about the data already. So this leads to another problem. Uh, which we call harking. So here the lines represent um, basically theories. So you have prior knowledge of the about the data, and then one of uh, the things that you measure comes out as significant. And then you say after after you found that, oh yeah, but all I, I knew about that all uh, after all. So uh, we call it harking, which is uh, hypothesizing after the results are known. And again, a solution here is pre-registration because pre-registration, if you pre-register all these three uh, studies, then uh, people know, oh, they did these three studies and you cannot say, oh, oh I only did this one. And oh yeah, that, that supported my hypothesis. So again, pre-registration can help here. So pre-registration, how can we define that? Um, for primary data, we could define it as specifying your data research design, data collection plan, and analysis plan before data collection starts. This data collection is, of course, part of that um, research pipeline. And for secondary data, it's a little bit simpler. It's specifying your analysis plan before doing the data analysis. And one thing you, you might know, uh, at least that I have experienced, it, is that it's really hard. And that's why we need to provide researchers with guidance. So that's what we try to do with this template. And Marianne will now go into uh, this process of developing this template. Yes, thanks, Olmo. Um, yeah, so um, as you uh, showed in the, in the slide before, uh, in traditional pre-registration um, for primary studies, so the, the way we, it was developed, um, you basically pre-register before data collection. And therefore also some people say like, yeah, 
we cannot pre-register secondary data because the data is already there. Um, and this was kind of a discussion, um, and, and, and this was discussed uh, especially at uh, the uh, SIPS meeting in 2017. Um, and because a group of people saw the advantages of pre-registration and wanted to use that as well for uh, secondary data, uh, but, but how to do that. So uh, at the Society uh, for uh, Improving Psychological Science, they had this discussion. Uh, I wasn't there yet, um, but uh, that resulted in a, also in a paper. And a lot of people were already involved in a discussion like, yeah, what, what is important for uh, these pre-registration of uh, secondary data? Um, another result of that uh, discussion was that in uh, the next uh, SIPS meeting in 2018, uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, we had uh, we organized a hacker shop or uh, Sarah, who was involved in the discussion, she wanted to do a, a hacker shop and uh, invited me and Olmo uh, to join because we had experience with uh, pre-registrations. And this hacker shop was basically a combination between a workshop and a hackathon. And in this workshop, uh, yeah, we had some people uh, gather um, who uh, had experience with pre-registration, but also with secondary data. And we just had a Q&A session about all those topics related to pre-registering secondary data. Pam was also there, so that was really great. Um, and I think we had a wonderful discussion. And most of the people also stayed because we continued with a hackathon for the rest of the day. And in this hackathon, the goal was to uh, yeah, get the first version of the, uh, a template for uh, a pre-registration uh, with uh, secondary data. Um, and um, yeah, we did really well on that day. I think it was really a, a good day because we, we had a very nice group of people. Um, we started with some general discussions about what is important in uh, secondary data. So uh, one of the things is, for example, uh, what Oma also said, you have often many uh, variables in these data sets. So it's really important that you uh, decide beforehand which variables you will use. Uh, so that is one important thing that you really, uh, uh, yeah, uh, describe which ones you are going to use. Um, and another thing that is, uh, of course, really important with secondary data is that you are really transparent about uh, your knowledge of the data. Um, because, of course, the data is already there. And, uh, well, in a, a, a pre-registration of, of primary data, people can be sure that the data is only collected afterwards. Um, yeah, the data is already there. and, and the researchers should be just transparent about their knowledge. So have they used the data before, which variables, these kind of things. So that was kind of an important part. So the, the description of the prior knowledge. Um, and then, um, yeah, we basically divided the people in, in groups. Oh, you can still, yeah. Uh, and uh, people were just discussed, used the, the OSF pre-registration template and they went over it in, in groups. Um, and uh, discussed whether these uh, uh, parts should be deleted, keep, uh, changed, or added. Uh, and you see a little bit of a picture that I, I was able to dig up uh, with our uh, whiteboard, which contained also all these different aspects that we went over. We went over it by two teams, and we also tried to, to test it. So we had a kind of an example study that we used uh, to see whether that worked. Um, and uh, yeah, it was really nice because by the end of the day, we had a first version. Um, of course, it was not finalized. So we wrapped it up uh, by email and uh, I just checked. And, and in uh, July, we submitted it to the OSF. So I think this went really fast, uh, which was really nice. Um, yeah, you can go to the next slide. Um, but of course, we, we are still discussing things by email and everything. So uh, uh, and, and, and we were thinking like, yeah, maybe we should give researchers even more guidance and do something with it uh, a little bit more. Um, and therefore, we proposed to write a tutorial paper. Um, and uh, we asked the, the SIPS participants to join. So maybe there were even more people at, at SIPS, but at least these one uh, 
kept being involved and uh, helped writing a tutorial paper. Um, again, we went over it in, in, in different groups, um, uh, trying to come up with, a, with an example. And this uh, tutorial uh, is also, um, uh, yeah, it will be uh, uh, published in uh, Meta Science, I think. Metapsychology, yeah. Metapsychology, yeah. And the preprint is, uh, is already available. Um, so I think that's my part right now, or do I have another slide now? <laughs> no, I'll take over from you. Yes, thanks. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go a little bit more into this uh, tutorial and to the template itself and how it looks on OSF. So um, our tutorial paper was uh, using an example and this example also features on the OSF template. An example was, uh, are more religious people more pro-social than less religious people? Um, that was a research question. Um, and we also used, of course, secondary data. And we used a data set, which is called the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study. And those are more than 10,000 graduates from Wisconsin high schools. Uh, I think in 1957 already it started. So it's really a long, uh, long-term data set. So we use that to, to answer this research question. And the research question was based on the golden rule. Um, that is uh, that you should treat others uh, like you yourself would be treated, would like to be treated. So, um, so once again, uh, the characteristics of secondary data that I discussed earlier. So it's a data buffet, which leads to a risk of p-hacking. And there uh, can be prior knowledge, which leads, leads to a risk of harking. And for both things, pre-registration can be a solution. And also both things are relevant to primary data analysis as well, but they are more uh, salient here uh, because of the features of secondary data. So what did we try to do with our template? So we have one, a couple of guiding heuristics and one is uh, specify your variables and statistical analysis in detail. So this goes back to this data buffet issue that there's so many variables to choose from that you should really be specific in which ones you are going to use in your analysis. So that you cannot use uh, A and then B and then C and then only use the one that works. So how does this look like in practice for our research question? Well, of course, we have to specify the data. Uh, this is all, all waves of data. And we decided to choose this one. Uh, within that wave are several surveys uh, on the phone or uh, through email. We chose these two, so we chose to uh, have some uh, questions about volunteering uh, to represent pro-social behavior. And there were some relig religiosity questions uh, to measure uh, the degree of relig religiosity people have. So this is, uh, uh, this is the example we used throughout the, the template. So you can see that if you look at the template on OSF, you can also see that uh, okay, this example comes across uh, many times. So we should be even more specific. Actually, we should also provide the actual variables and preferably how they are called uh, in the data. So they are called IL001RER. Uh, so please also specify that because that uh, really makes things easier. And we use two variables, uh, two measures to assess pro-social behavior. As I said, it was about volunteering. We use the binary measure did you do that in the last 12 months? And we used uh, a more continuous measure. And you should also specify how all these items and variables are scored. So it's, there's a lot of information you need to provide. And the OSF templates give some guidance here. So this is a sneak peek. So on the left, you see all uh, basically categories of questions you get. And we have now already landed on the variables one because I wanted to uh, highlight that because it's so important for secondary data. And at the top here, you can see the question about variables. So there's a, a little bit of an explanation of what, what you should provide. Um, and also you can click here on show example, and then it pops open and you get basically what I just show, uh, sh shown you on the slide before, uh, all these variables and how they are measured, et cetera. So this gives you some, some guidance as well. Um, what you also should do is your, uh, specify your analyses because it might be clear which variables you have, but how do you are going to use them in the analysis itself, of course, is also vital. So 
here we use two different regression analyses, one using the binary dependent variable and one using the continuous one. And also here, it's important to not forget outliers, missing data and inference criteria. And of course, in the template, you're also prompted to uh, specify this. So here's an example of how it looks like again. So now we came to the category analyses and you see at the top statistical models. So here, small description of what you need to specify. And again, there is an example uh, based on our religiosity research question. And uh, just thought I would highlight this. Uh, we also included our code in our example, which is uh, just good practice that I just wanted to forward here in this, <laughs> in this webinar. So there was one thing, the data buffet. That's basically be, be specific about everything you're going to do. Then there's also this prior knowledge issue. So you might already know some, some things about the data. So how do other people know that you're actually not using that prior knowledge uh, to, to, do, to choose which analysis you're going to do? Because uh, if you already know, OK, uh, A leads to B, if you've already seen the data and you know that A is positively associated with B, then it doesn't make sense to do that hypothesis, right? Because you already know the answer. So to, to assess those things, uh, we also ask in this template, okay, what is your prior knowledge about the data set you're using? So this is an answer. Uh, you don't have to read it. I'll just walk you through the most important things. So you should, uh, if you already used some variables in another analysis, name those variables. Um, if you find any associations of those variables with other variables, to note that. Um, what could be the consequences of this uh, association? So what does it have for an effect on your current hypotheses that you're now trying to test? And are you going to control for it, basically? So in this example, we included a control variable in our analysis because we had some suspicion based on our prior knowledge that that might be relevant to our new analysis. So this way your prior knowledge can even improve the analysis you're doing. So this is again what it looks like on OSF. Um, you can see here also this field can be blank. Those red stars indicate uh, obligatory items. So this is arguably the most important one uh, because it's so unique to secondary data. So that's why it has a, a red uh, asterisk here. And uh, an accompanying item is this one, which says to list your prior work using this data set. So uh, including any relevant variables you analyzed uh, and preferably for each uh, author separately. And this is important because a list of these publications or, or talks can help others assess whether your answer to question 18, the previous question is plausible. So you can say, okay, I have no prior knowledge of the data in the previous question. But then if you list uh, eight papers that you used uh, and where you use this data set, it might not be plausible that you indeed have no prior knowledge at all about the data set. So that's why we also included this uh, question. And here's an example of an answer. So all three authors. So do this for each author separately. Um, show which conferences you uh, might have presented this data and also whether you have submitted it somewhere or whether it's published somewhere. So this is a for important information for others to check uh, possibility of your prior knowledge. And of course, these items, the questions are uh, linked together uh, under the header knowledge of data. So there's some potential difficulties with this. Uh, we are aware of that and we'll probably uh, learn about questions in the Q&A as well about this. Um, so what prior knowledge is irrelevant? That's a hard question uh, because you're, yeah, you can't really be sure. So that's why uh, one guiding principle I, I would say is be inclusive. If you're in doubt, just include it. You know, uh, preferably more information than less information. And another one is what if you have unconscious prior knowledge? So that means that you forgot about something about the data, for example, how do you uh, get to know this? In this, you can be try to be exhaustive. So really dig through your memory, 
and see, oh yeah, I did this paper and would then they learn again about the data sets. So really uh, carefully list all the previous things you've done on, with data sets uh, and be exhaustive in that. And uh, some, some things are bound to pop up. Um, so now I'll give the floor back to Marianne uh, because our template is also being actually used. So that's, that's great. And hopefully even more so now that's an OSF, but Marianne is gonna walk you through some uh, research examples that uh, were based on our template. Yes. Um, so uh, yeah, I was uh, for this webinar uh, checking uh, some some examples, and it's just really nice to see that that people are really using it, and um, I think that that's just great. We also see uh, here I have some titles, so we we see uh, different uh, examples, uh, things about personality traits and political preferences, more developmental uh, studies. Um, uh, uh, but also in uh, what predicts uh, teachers, ICT related professional development. So there are a lot of different things uh, that, that it's uh, used for. Uh, so I think that's great. And I just wanted to show some uh, parts of it. Uh, so uh, this is a uh, pre-registration by, uh, uh, by uh, Caitlin and uh, Pamela. Um, and here we see a little bit of the, the data description uh, so they describe which um, uh, which data set they used, uh, the years that it's uh, from, um, where it is available, um, when it was downloaded, um, and um, also uh, that they haven't looked at it further, and also that uh, where the codebook can be found. So this is more of a general data description. Um, and uh, I think if we go to the next slide, then uh, they describe also very neat what their knowledge of the data is. So um, Caitlin hasn't worked with it, uh, but uh, Pam is very familiar, but she not with the things that he, she uses right now, but she has used some other variables. So like uh, uh, social demographic variables, parents, educational attainments, and so on. So I think this is really shows how you can describe that. And, and it, it's not that something is wrong or correct, but it, it's just be as transparent as possible about your prior knowledge. Um, so here we see another one, uh, which is about uh, self-reported personality traits and political preferences. Uh, and we say do multiple studies. So they have some with primary data and, and also with secondary data. Um, and um, yeah, you can go to the next slide. Um, so here they also give um, uh, an example about the, uh, a, a paper that they used uh, with, with the same uh, panel data um, and a description of that. Um, and uh, they also state that they that they don't have prior knowledge uh, about uh, uh, the trends that they will be working with. Um, although they have now this, of course, also this publication. So, uh, but, but probably they are about different parts, but I didn't go into that as much as possible, but uh, to, to see that, but here you can see that, that you can just uh, show, um, yeah, what you already have done uh, with, uh, with, the pay, uh, with the data. Um, and there's also this example, which was also one of the papers in which they, um, uh, they, they combined uh, different data sets. So they had uh, all those individual researchers had collected data about personality traits and also uh, cortisol and testosterone levels, I think. And now they wanted to combine everything. Um, and uh, this, I think this is really great and interesting to really combine all this data, uh, but it also means that, of course, uh, researchers know already their own data because they have collected it, maybe published already about this, um, but they were really transparent about that. So, for example, they mentioned a selection of the researchers may know individual data sets very well, particularly given that some publications have resulted from their use. And then they refer to the end of the document with all the publications. And again, this is a, is also to show you how um, yeah how you can be just transparent about this. Um, and of course, if you pre-register, <laughs> almost always something 
doesn't work out as you planned. Um, and I wanted to show these two examples, I think, uh, uh, because, yeah, uh, that's not a, not bad or, uh, or something, but it, it's, it's just that you should be, uh, again, transparent also about these deviations. And uh, yeah, we found here uh, two deviations that were uh, presented in notes in the, in the final papers. So one is about the convergence issue. Yeah, if you run uh, complicated models, then often you also encountered uh, convergence issues. And then, of course, you have to make some decisions. Um, and they describe here what they did. And in the uh, second uh, example, uh, they stated that they, uh, in their pre registration, they in intended to have uh, at least 4,000 participants. But in the end, they had just a little bit less than uh, 4,000. Um, also, I think just a minor issue, but at least they uh, presented it very uh, transparently. Um, oh yeah, uh, so uh, just to uh, wrap up, um, yeah, for these uh, pre-registration of secondary data, it's really important that you uh, specify your uh, variables. So be very clear about which uh, variables you want to include. Um, because often there are many, many variables, uh, and also how you will analyze, analyze them. Um, and of course, the prior knowledge. So do this for every author that is involved in the project. And um, yeah, of course, uh, yeah, it's better to be very extensive about it and, and just add all the information that you have uh, and, and be honest. Um, yeah, you might have some prior knowledge, but just be open and honest about it. Um, so uh, pre-registration is hard, and I think secondary uh, pre-registration of secondary data is also hard because of uh, these additional uh, things like this prior knowledge. But it's also really worthwhile because uh, in, in, in this way you can uh, uh, have others uh, and yourself as well have more confidence in the validity of your findings. Um, so I think that's uh, just really uh, important and, 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 and worthwhile to, to do this. And I hope that this tutorial, this template and how it's now implemented in uh, the uh, OSF will make it easier for everyone. Thank you, Marjan. Um, I've just included a link to the paper there for everyone to take a look at. Uh, I'm right now going to share my screen and show you a little bit how to access the secondary data registration form, give a couple of um, final reminders and a homework assignment. If you're attending today, we, we do ask for a little bit of feedback from you. So please um, be ready for that in just a moment. Uh, and then we'll open it up the, the floor for Q&A. Let me share my screen. So this is the OSF registry. There are a couple of neat new features. If you've used OSF before, there are a couple of recent improvements that I'm really excited to show off. Uh, so you can get to the OSF registry, um, just do this osf.io registries. Um, and you don't have to have an, uh, an existing OSF project or anything like that. Um, you can just select add new. Um, if you do have analysis code or project description on an OSF project that you, you want to have, um, you, you may do that. Um, but many of the times this will be the first step in starting a new project. So do you have content? No. Um, and then this secondary data pre-registration template is available on the drop-down list of fields. Create draft. Now I'll take just a moment as the gears uh, spin in the background. I call this uh, Firefly just so I can show something else in a moment. And here's where you start getting into the um, meat of the study. One important uh, that, that, that Alma and Marion have already given sort of an explanation and uh, demo of where it is. One additional thing that I'll point out is the My Registrations tab. So once you have a draft available on OSF, this My Registrations tab shows you all of your um, submitted pre-registrations um, and the drafts of those will be available here in the draft tab. All right. 
Let me. Um, follow up with a couple of final points. Marianne uh, mentioned this uh, a little bit, but some of the points that we like to emphasize once you've pre registered and are writing up the results of pre registered work, there's a couple of uh, reminders to make sure to follow. Uh, this one should be relatively obvious if you've done it before, but, uh, but just remember that when submitting the results of registered work for, for publication in any journal, make sure to include a, a link to that. Each registration on OSF has a persistent unique identifier to include that uh, when describing your study design and pre-registration. Report the results of all of your pre-specified analyses. If you have 10 analyses, one huge large model, whatever it is, uh, make sure to report the results of, of, of each of those analyses that were included in the pre-registration. Any unregistered analyses can and should be included, but just indicate those with, with uh, clear descriptions or under a different a heading. Uh, re report that as unregistered work. Generally speaking, uh, that is best described as exploratory analysis that deserve to be um, later confirmed, uh, but sometimes there'll be a little bit of blur in between there and that's okay too. As long, and that is only understandable if it's sort of clearly what clearly indicated what was registered and what was not part of that pre-registration. And as Marjan mentioned, um, any changes uh, to the pre-specified plan, uh, please include that. You can't, there's a template of how to document that. Uh, if it's not just clearly indicated in the text, it should also be there. Uh, but these transparent changes are a way to give better clarity and better context for the results of all pre-specified work. In one moment, I'm going to share a link. Once I stop sharing my screen, I'm going to share a link to a feedback form. And so take a look on the OSF registry, start a draft of the secondary data courage form if you'd like to. Uh, and we'd love to hear uh, about it. We've been really racking our brains about uh, how individuals, how different disciplines in particular um, interact with these types of issues. So let us know what discipline you're coming from. Um, and then basically let us know what you like or, or, or don't like about the form. If there are questions on there that don't quite make sense, sometimes even very basic words like study or experiment mean different things in different disciplines. So we wanna be aware of how um, the, the diction provided by this template, uh, um, how that makes sense to you or not. So please go ahead and use this form. We'll share this also uh, in an email afterwards and be tweeting it out and using it for user feedback. Um, but, but once you've taken a close look at the pre-registration template, please let us know what you think about it. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and open the floor for Q&A. I see we have a couple there. First thing I'm gonna do is thank the panelists. Second thing I'm gonna do is share the feedback form. And then third thing I'll do, oh my gosh, is stop sharing. All right, let me take a look at the Q&A here. I think there is also a raised hand, so I'll be taking a look at that. Um, Next, please give me a moment. But you easier asks, is there? Um, um, I can take Patricia's question. Yeah, please do. I'll know. You want? Yeah, so Patricia's asking uh, or stating that there's a, uh, this pre registration uh, requires a lot of ethical commitments from uh, preventing authors from running out, uh, a lot of p hacking and harking before doing the pre-registration. So um, they say, okay, yeah, you can just basically do all the harking before and be hacking and then pre-register your stuff. And then uh, you would still get the benefits of pre-registration, which could be uh, more, the people think your research is more credible, for example. And I think that is correct. So, and I think there's not really a way to uh, avoid that. So if you really want to cheat the system, uh, if you really want to be a bad scientist, so to say, then then you can. So uh, pre-registration is not foolproof, and this is still uh, can still be a problem. Um, 
but we tried to circumvent this a little bit by uh, including in our template. I don't think it's implemented in OSF template, but it's in our original one or raw one, basically. Uh, like a statement saying, okay, with uploading this pre-registration, we're saying, okay, we were truthful about our prior knowledge, and this is the only uh, pre-registration that we do about this hypothesis or research question. So um, having such a formal statement, hopefully increases the barrier for people to actually do this kind of cheating that uh, that you mentioned uh, because if you uh, say this like formally if you have a formal statement like this and you do other stuff anyway then it's more like fraud really official fraud and hopefully that is like a barrier for people to 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 engage in these practices uh, but still if there's a will there's a way you can cheat if you want i think uh next one next question thank you all know going to uh, Pam. This is from Alaria. I was wondering about the main analysis versus robust robustness tests. Do you recommend or suggest uh, to register both? Um, and if so, should that be the same or, or in different pre-registrations? Thank you for the answer. Yes. Um, so we pre-register our robustness checks because we're using correlational data. And so we almost always know we have to do robustness checks um, on the correlational data. However, having said that, um, having done now two secondary data pre-registrations, one of the things I want to point out, because you're often using, in my case, we're often using um, national population studies. And even though I'm really familiar uh, with the data, the child development supplement PSID I actually designed. So in some ways, it's my primary data collection of which people are doing secondary data analysis. Uh, I'm doing secondary data analysis. Um, there are things that you think you know about how data was collected. And then as you're actually analyzing it, you go in thinking, okay, they asked us at three time points, but they did something crazy like change the way the question was actually asked, even though they're calling it the same thing uh, in the third wave. And you, you don't realize that till you're actually like analyzing the data. So what we do when we have robustness checks or things that show up afterwards is that we do amendments to our pre-registration and state exactly that. We say on this date, we found out as we were analyzing the data that the question that has exactly the same variable name, but was in year three was actually asked in a different way. Thus, we're not sure whether or not the correlation we're seeing or the lack thereof is related to the change of the question. And so we just, we put that in. And for robustness checks, if we realize a question has come up or we're asked a question like, but how do you not know it's this? And so we've added a robustness check, we do an amendment and we say on this date, due to a question by a reviewer or a question by a lab member, we have done, we have added a robustness check and we have not touched the data. This is what we think. And, and I have to tell you this, it is very hard. You have to retrain yourself. You're right in the data set not to analyze that when a question comes up. You have to stop, which is what we've done with the pre-registration, talk about it, decide how we're going to approach it, write the amendment, and then do it that way, just to try to keep, and, and it's both somewhat freeing to actually have those conversations instead of doing analyses on the fly and not remembering why you did stuff, which comes up during review and actually having it detailed. So we think of this as also just our lab manual of how we write out everything we've done and decisions that have been made. So it really helps us. But I would either, so if you know ahead of time you're gonna do robustness checks, you can put them in the pre-reg or you can use the amendment to your pre-reg, which we have used way more often than I thought we were gonna do, but we use that quite frequently. I'm going to um, uh, allow Greg Murray uh, has his hands raised. Uh, Greg, be ready. I'm going to, oh, I think you sh should have microphone ability now. Hi, folks. Thank you so much for this. This is really, this is an interesting um, presentation. I've been interested in it for a long time. I am the editor of a journal. We've been pushing more open science um, projects. We've made some progress with registered reports. Uh, you know, I would like to do some of these pre-registered secondary analyses of secondary data. I'm wondering sort of more from the writing it up in the manuscript side, because sometimes reviewers have different <laughs> visions of people's research than the researchers do themselves. So uh, there are a couple issues. Pam sort of addressed this with the robustness check answer. Uh, say the reviewer just wants a completely different analysis of some uh, 
of some kind. I think my understanding would be you'd still be compelled to do, well, I don't know, I guess I'm, maybe I'm assuming something I shouldn't be. Are you still, do you still do your analysis? And how do you say, well, we were gonna do analysis A, but reviewer didn't like it, so we had to take it out. Um, and then how do you hint, I mean, I, in a register report, you would deal with this sort of stuff as sort of exploratory analyses or something along that, along those lines. How would you identify it in the actual manuscript as in a section, I don't know, called reviewer requested analyses or I, I don't know. Part of me says just throw it back at the reviewer and, <laughs> you know, I don't know. So I guess from I'm trying to figure out how to manage that stuff. I've actually called that reviewer harking when um, reviewers want us to go back and change our question. I'll just answer this briefly because other people probably have opinions too that um, what we've done is I usually reply to that request and say this is a pre-registered study so we followed our pre-registration. Um, this would be new, I can add it, but I have to add it into an exploratory section just like you said, Greg, and I have to state that, that this was off the pre-reg. Um, so, and, and if I, if I do that, I can also pre-register. I can put a supplemental in, as I just said, and, and uh, to my pre-reg saying, based on a reviewer comment, we've added this. This was not the intent of the original study. And so this is exploratory in nature. What I tell my students to do, especially with our correlational data, is that they also have to up the p-value. So I don't want to see on exploratory data a p-value of 0.05. I want them to be much harsher. We have to like charge ourselves for doing exploratory data. So we're looking for things at 0 0.001. And I explain that back when I, I, I send the paper back in. That's helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next question, I think from Emma Jones asking about um, uh, the conflict between disclosing prior knowledge and journals uh, that use the double blind peer review system. Um, just sort of stating, I understand that there's no perfect solution, but I wonder if any discussions have been had with journal editors in this regard. Um, yes, no, and all the way in between. Uh, does anybody want to step with step on? Uh, Marjorie, do you want to start? And Pam, uh, have you had any experience dealing with um, uh, editorial processes of that double blind peer review and peer registration. I, I saw just one example when I was going over these examples uh, and they uh, they kind of copy paste the pre-registration, I think from the OSF again to a file in which they just removed some of the, 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 the names. Uh, so they try to to make it uh, uh, as blind as possible and and send that in or or use that uh, to share with the reviewer. So that might be one solution that is is used. Yeah, we just dealt with this last week. So um, and this was for psych science, which has the double blind, and we had to have a conversation about it. What do we do? This is a pre-registered study. We have it stated in the the abstract. So what we did is what you would do it when it's blinded to author is that we said this is pre-registered and we blinded the OSF pre-registration for review, but that it's that it's available. So that's what we've done. You can also, so I know create a view only link for registration. We, we ran into this where we could do things with projects, but not registration. So where it was harder to do, but I think you, you could do, like I said, the old, like not revealing the author, you can do the same thing saying blinded for review, but this is a pre-registered study. And then you, uh, David gave the anonymous option as well. It is, it is a little bit concerning that you want to state that you've pre-registered, but a pre-registration can find the people who actually did it. But I will tell you, having heard this and, and actually just to note, this is unethical as well, but people often take the title of the paper and just do a Google search on it and they get to the pre-registration. So um, again, authors aren't supposed to do that under a double blind, but I, I frequently on Twitter hear people say, oh yeah, I just looked it up. And I'm like, well, you know, a double blind, you're not supposed to know the authors. But anyway, that, that's, that's just, a, you can do the best you can and, and, and hope it stays double blind if, if that, I'm not, I'm not big on double blind related reviews, but if that's the case for your journal. All right, this question coming in from um, David Disabato. How do you recommend handling peer registering um, 
the scoring process when you don't know the psychometrics of the data. For example, it'd be hard to specify what scoring you will use until you have done psychometric analysis. Do you recommend doing those analyses before or after you've created the pre-registration? I don't want to be the only one answering, but um, <laughs> for that, <laughs> um, because uh, for psychometric stuff, I often do know what I'm going to use. So um, I, I guess I don't know the example. So in this case, I, if you're using, um, if I know that I have to get internal reliability, then I state that I'm going to get internal reliability and I state the items that I'm going to be doing that on. Generally, that is also dictated by the field because I'm using other measures. So I'm, I'm going to be doing the scale that the measure comes from. Um, exploratory factor analysis may be what you're referring to, and then that would, um, I would register the exploratory factor analysis, then saying, you know, things like, is it something that a lot of people don't Pam, I'm not sure if this is just on mine, but... And in there's a little bit of breaking up. Um, and for, forward that you can take 10, 20% of your data explore. Oops. Shoot. <laughs> That's okay. You're coming in and out. Okay. Um, Sorry about that. Um, so that you can take 10 to 20% of your data, explore on that, and then uh, confirm on the rest. So you could do that with the psychometrics as well. You could look at the data, uh, a random 10 to 20 percent, depending on what sample size you have, and then confirm on the rest. So again, these these are all things that you can pre-register, and if you have to change from your pre-registration, you can do an amendment to the pre-registration. Thank you. Let's see. Um, this one from Jim. I'll pass to um, Olmo. Uh, let's see. Would a way? Let's see. Oh, I'm sorry. I answer that. Would a way to somewhat demonstrate you've not seen the data prior to analysis be to randomly sample the data if the size of the data set makes it feasible with the seed to random sample dictated by something after the registration, such as like a, you know, lottery numbers or the results of a, foot, a future football match. <laughs> I don't know if this would make sense or be reasonable. It sounds cool. Um, and it is doable. It definitely sounds Almost. cool. Yeah. It's an interesting suggestion, uh, but I think no. So if you, for example, know the ins and outs of a data set, um, then, and then just to take a random sample of that data set, uh, odds are that you still know about patterns in the data, right? So it's just that you're taking a random sample of something you know. So in that random sample, you probably also know about patterns. Um, so that's different from knowing something about one part of the data set and then confirming it in another, like, uh, like Pam just discussed. Um, so now you know something, take a sample of that, but then you still know something about that little sample. So I, I'm not sure if this is really would be a solution, uh, but maybe someone else has a, other thoughts. I don't have other thoughts because I think you described that well, Amo, but um, I, I just also want to note to people, you know, in the real world of doing analyses, um, I've used, I'm, I'm a full professor, I've used most large scale education and developmental data sets. And so I have a lot of knowledge of them. I ran a center where we replicated across longitudinal data sets. So I know a lot about them. This doesn't mean I know every question or possible uh, question that comes up. And I think that the point of doing secondary pre-reg and why it's so important for secondary data is so that you can restrict what you're looking at in these data sets to the questions of interest, your scientific questions. That otherwise people are, you're, going, you're in correlational data sets, you're gonna find lots of things that look like they matter that don't actually matter. And, uh, and the point of the pre-reg isn't to try to stop you from doing science. It's to make sure that the people who are reading what you're doing and need to, and want to replicate it or to see how theirs compares to yours knows what you did and that the reviewers know what you did. So, um, so again, I think if you have prior knowledge ahead of time and you're pulling a piece, you just note that in your pre-registration and let the reviewers decide if they think that that's too close to what you did or you were too knowledgeable, thus it moved your analyses in a certain direction that it should not. Just be upfront about it. 
and and then the reviewers can decide if they think that that's going to change the outcome or if it again led you to a finding that was not maybe a true finding but a spurious finding from the way that you looked at it i um i'll answer this question here we got two more questions in the queue right now uh i jumped the gun on this one accidentally copied it in to everyone's chat that's fine i'll go ahead and answer it right now um, what's the best way to add these time stamped amendments to an OSF um, registration? Uh, there, there are two ways, there are a couple of ways to do that. Um, and I'll, in just a moment, post some uh, links to both of those. When you do create a registration on the back end, there is a live OSF project where you do um, store files, uh, uh, data sets, code, anything you want. Um, and one of those can and should be a, 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 either in a, one of the wikis on the OSF project or just an uploaded document. Every time you upload it, it'll be timestamped um, and you can indicate when that change or amendment was what was um, occurred. On the registration itself, th those are frozen. There are a few fields on um, in the registration metadata. I'll post a link to that, that you can update the description if there's anything you'd like to, to note there and I'll provide some example of what that looks like also. Um, but I recommend using the back end OSF project um, as an example uh, for how to do that. The last question, um, this is uh, right in between uh, maybe primary and secondary, but we'll see what the panel thinks. What about new research questions that are generated during and not after the data collection? Do you call those secondary data? Um, I guess given the data collection started, it could still be called secondary data for registration. What do you think? So Amo, you kind of went over this during the presentation, right? That um, even, so the primary data collection that was based on, if it was based on hypothesis testing, and I, I do want to note that a lot of these, as Amo also said, the institutional data collected or collected for surveys, large scale surveys are collected for the community. And so they, not that they aren't generally related to some kind of larger issues of hy hypothesis testing, they're not specific. Um, and so those, those will be utilized as secondary data. But in the case of doing primary data, you had specific hypotheses, um, but now, now other people, another student comes in, they have a different question. You can register that, um, and Alma, correct me if I'm incorrect about this, but you can register that as a secondary uh, registration because it wasn't what the data was originally collected for. And I'll tell you, that's an advantage because when you get to a position where you're like, well, I would have liked to have asked this, but the data didn't have that, that really is a secondary data problem more than a primary data, right? You should have, if, if it was your primary data, you should have, you should have collected the right data. So again, in that situation where you have a different question, pre-registering it as a secondary um, data would be, I think, much more to your advantage than trying to do it as primary. Yeah, I fully agree. I think actually our, our template is uh, particularly useful for these situations uh, because uh, prior knowledge is bound to be an issue here uh, because you're already working with the data. So, um, so the questions in our template about prior knowledge are definitely useful to, to use. A um, couple of answers are coming through. I think Almo, you might be providing perhaps a few. Um, last question in our last minute, David. Um, Desabato asks, what happens when you realize that the pre-register analysis is not the, the right one? Maybe you attended a methods section or methods class um, and, and you figured out a better way to do it. Any final thoughts for that from um, David Desabato? Yeah, that, that happens frequently. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, mostly, you know, students are, are using these pre-registrations a lot and they're learning stuff as time goes on. So to the extent that I can catch it ahead in time and say we need to do a different analysis, that's great. Things are changing. I use missing data analysis a lot. Sometimes things are updated and so we have to go back and change. This is what we use the amendments for. Uh, right now we have, we, we, uh, we have a pre-registration, one of the ones that were highlighted that we're running into a binary mediation related. We're trying to figure out what the analysis should be. So we can't formally pre-register until we, we figure it out. But a lot of times people will throw in a structural equation model and then they find out that's not really the appropriate 
analyses they thought it was. And so they do an amendment and say, upon additional information and consultation with statistical people, we've decided on this, that's an amendment. And we are at time. I wanna respect our, and thank our, our panelists for their time um, and, and work to date to, to get this up and running. We're super appreciative of it. Thank you again, and everybody have a great day. Bye. Thanks.